and welcome to Two Wheels Better for the first of two visits to this year's NEC Bike Show. And from a green Harley Davidson to a green Kawasaki. Most of you will know I've got a soft spot for Kawasaki's and this one's no exception. I haven't ridden it yet, but I want to ride it. This is the ZX9. I've got with me Martin Lambert. He's the marketing manager. You've got an easy job with this one, haven't you, Martin? Many thanks, Jeff. Yeah, it's a wonderful bike and I'm very lucky I have managed to ride one of these and it is a wonderful machine this year. Yeah, so I've read it's got over a, a lot of the problems that the old ZX9 was purported to have, this sort of rear suspension jack-up thing. Mm. I think much was written and said about the old ZX9, which perhaps wasn't entirely accurate, but with this bike, it's lighter, it's got more power, and we're expecting great things of it. Yeah, because you've done mods all around, haven't you? It's a new frame, the new geometry we've spoken about, but you've even got magnesium covers on the side of the engine as well. Yeah, it's very much a very new motor motorcycle. We've saved 35 kilograms of weight. We've saved weight in all sorts of areas. We've got rare earth magnets in the alternator. We've got a titanium silencer, which is the first for a motorcycle. Can I ask you, rare earth magnets, is that too much of a technical question? I mean, what are rare earth magnets? Mm. Or shouldn't have earth? It sounds technical, but really it means that they're more magnetic. They can be slimmer. We can make the alternator slimmer. We can chamfer an angle on it. And for you, Jeff, you can lean over further. Oh, excellent. That's great. Well, one thing, when I was playing around earlier, before you saw me, I was actually sitting on it, the tank seems very wide, as of the old ZX9. I was expecting to be a bit slimmer. Is there a reason for that? Well, ergonomics has come into the world of motorcycling now, and the reason for that is that you have a dynamic fit on the bike, and that helps you under braking forces. You're actually stopped from riding up over the tank. If the tank was any thinner, you might find yourself over the instruments. Yeah, which could be a little painful. So, so the only real proof of this one is for me to take this out on a little spin. Absolutely, that's very kind of you to make the offer. But I bet you won't let me out on this one. Not yet, mate, but this is one of the bikes that's on the press fleet and you can come and ride it any time you like. I shall look forward to that. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks a lot, Martin. One of the new machines on the Honda stand this year is this 600cc Honda Hornet. This is Dave Hancock from Honda. Dave, tell me about this Hornet. The, the Harney Hornet, the you Harley called Hornet. it. Yeah, we do, yeah. You like it, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> it's, um, it's a CBR 600 engine, basically. Um, uh, originally, it was in Japan, it was imported um, just for the Japanese market as a 250 and a 400. Um, they've now produced a 600 version, which is for Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, it's aimed really at um, sort of the commuter type of, uh, you know, fun type of thing, you know. Um, and uh, the main competitor in the market is going to be something like the Suzuki Bandit, really. Right. Uh, it's priced at 4995 which is very competitive. Mm -hmm. And um, it's going to be available, I think, around about February time. Right. I mean, I've seen these in the, the 250 ones that have been imported to this country. I've ridden one of them, and that goes really well. I just can't yeah. imagine how well this is going to go. It's not a very big bike. It's physically not small. Presumably, well, I don't know, it's probably not very heavy. It's got a CBR 600 lump under there, and yeah. it's going to go like the clappers, isn't it? Yeah, it will. It's got um, five-blade wheels in it as well. Yeah. And uh, what they've done is they've taken the CBR 600 engine and given it a lot more mid-range torque. Mm. So uh, it's got so much, you know, grunt in the, you know, um, and so much torque too. It's brilliant, really, to ride. Yeah. It looks like a lot of fun. So what yeah. we're looking at early next year for one of these? Yeah, it will be about February time. Yeah. Yeah. So excellent. Be good. Put my name down. Thank you. So I'm on my jollies. I'm a chuff on my jollies. The fact that I'm on a beach and I've got a lake behind me. What I am here for, actually, is this um, unbelievable. In fact, I'm gobsmacked. Richard Fincher from Bike Magazine, the editor, big commander-in-chief. What the chuffing hell are people doing? What they're actually up to is trying to win three grand. That's what it really boils down to. Oh, have you got a spare boat or anything I could use? Oh, sorry, mate, no. All oh, right, OK. But, uh, you see, ours. Ours is a... Well, actually, ours is a bit of a hopeless effort because it was nicked. <laughs> Uh, desirable, uh, desirable. Well, this is the whole point. See, when you put that much money up for grabs, then people are going to uh, half inch what you're trying to do the uh, do the competition on. Anyway, as you can see, I don't know whether you fancy having a quick look at this uh, bizarre operation that's coming out with uh, Captain Bismarck there on in control. But anyway, what they're trying to do is they've got to ride a bike into the water and then uh, out of it again on the. Uh, which is proving quite troublesome for some this, of them. This the last bit, obviously, is the. Uh, yeah, the this, is the, uh, the this is the. This uh, is the tricky bit. Hang on a sec. It's obviously dangerous. This job, isn't it? Uh, well, at times, yeah. Um, what he's done there is he's set up. 
like a paddles and things on his tyre, put another engine on the back of it. You can do anything you like, basically. I think we're going to have to stand back a bit. We had a bit around there, yeah. yeah. This is true outside broadcasting, this is. Bike style, boat style, or something style. Yeah, well, yeah. you see, what we're... We pride ourselves on knowing an awful lot about motorbikes and almost sort of all about boats. And I think you're seeing the sort of uh, absolute uh, result of, uh, of those two that knowledge what, meshing you, together. You're, you're obviously warp, you chaps from Bike Magazine. You must be to even think of doing something adapters this. Well, it happened a long time ago. We thought we needed something just to warm up the end of the year. You know, I mean, give people a little bit of a lift because motorcycling kind of drops off a little bit in the winter. Yeah, obviously, people right getting cold yeah, and such yeah. like. So we thought, well, you know, you need something to keep people. So we come to a Mediterranean beach here at the NEC Absolutely, bike show. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Look at this. See, Mediterranean beach yeah. with grass and, yeah. uh, and such like. Actually, it? it's fairly quite nice climate, really. And I suppose the answer is, is to leave these here viewers to have a look at these strange creations in it, really. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks very much for talking to us. What a problem. And about the 3,000. Can I just have your word about that 3,000 pounds, right, if you don't mind? Well, this is the new Yamaha R1. The shorter, lighter, faster, madder Yamaha. But look, it fits me. And I'm really impressed by this because I thought it might just be a little bit too tiny. So short wheelbase or not, it seems to be the business. And I've got with me Jeff Turner of Yamaha, who I'm sure will tell me it's the business. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, I had a quick ride in it last week at the press launch in Spain, and I can tell you it is unbelievable. Yeah. It really is a new generation of motorcycle. It's hard to describe it, you know, until someone's ridden it. But Even it... for a man like you, yeah? I'll have a go. <laughs> But um, no, the reviews I've read so far have all raved about it, and this is going to, I mean, the, the Fireblade was the benchmark, but it looks as though this one is shaping up to be the new benchmark, that's what you'd hope for, I presume. Yeah, I think you've got to look at this and remember it's got a lot of new technology on it, and uh, okay, it's short, but there's a reason why it's short, because they've made the shortest engine uh, ever, ever produced on a four-cylinder bike, which means we can have a long swing arm, but still keep a short wheelbase. Yeah. So there's all sorts of new technical developments which actually make the bike quite significantly better on the road and the track. Well, I was going to ask you about that, because short wheelbases normally it stands for sort of twitchiness and all the rest of it, but with this longer swinging arm, and it's mounted on the back of the engine, isn't it? No, it's not, actually. No, ah. don't believe everything you read. Yeah. Um, it is... Uh... I'll correct that, yeah. <laughs> that is what I've read. <laughs> but anyway, you carry on. No, it's uh, a very long swing arm. is a bit like Grand Prix technology. If you can get a very short engine, a long swing arm gives you a lot of um, traction control um, you know, as the power is delivered through the back wheel. Yeah. And also an added advantage with a long swing arm is a very, very far forward pivot point. Uh, with a 50-50 weight distribution on the bike and a far forward pivot point, the thing is very stable even under power. It doesn't tend to lift the front wheel, which is always one of the problems if you have a very light bike on a rough surface. That's right, it's just too, too easy to loft the front end. And this lightweight technology, I mean, a new frame as well, and so everything's been concentrated on getting the weight down, hasn't it? Yeah, the bike has been designed as a whole. Um, the engine guys and the chassis guys work very closely together. Uh, one of the key features of the engine is that it's very, very strong. It is a structural part of the chassis which then means that you can reduce the frame weight by quite a, quite a considerable amount. And you can see the indentations there which allow the handlebars to be positioned close. You can actually make the frame very, very light but still keep the strength because the engine is uh, supporting it. Yeah. How much, I mean, Yamaha alone, I know Honda used to do, but they provided the Formula One engine for the Arrows this year. That sort of technology must overspill. I don't know whether the bikes came first, or as it were, but they intermingle, don't they? Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, Formula One engine has used uh, various things that we use on motorcycles, five-valve heads, uh, X-up valves, um, some of the trick ignition uh, components now with throttle position sensors and gearbox sensors and so forth. So, so there's a lot of technology on here, and it's, it's a test bed, really, uh, a Formula One engine. OK, well, that's excellent, Jeff. And tell me the price of this thing. Uh, how much is it going to be? The price is yet to be announced. Uh, delivery will be in early January. Yeah. And you'll have to wait until probably December before you find out the exact retail price. But can I say competitive in the marketplace? Well, thanks very much, Jeff. And while I fantasise with this R1, I wonder what that Paul Johnson's up to. Well, they're all singing and dancing on the Yamaha stand. They think they've got a world beater with their R1. But this thing behind me really is still the benchmark for sports bikes, and it has been since it was launched in 1992. For 98, the Fireblade gets 80% new engine internals, only produces another two brake horsepower, but it accelerates better, it's got sharper styling, a redesigned fairing, better brakes, and it really still is the one to beat. Now, there's a good reason why I'm stood here with these two retrobates, because this particular chap here, Wayne, is the governor of the Derby Empire in the UK, and this particular chap here, Tris, 
is going to be a racer in a Derby Racing Series. So first of all, I suppose the answer is, let's have a word with Wayne to find out what the hell the Derby Racing Series is all about. OK, well, for years he's been uh, racing in this country, as everybody knows, but they've never allowed youngsters to, uh, uh, to race 50cc bikes. For the first time ever, you now an 11-year-old can race a motorcycle in the UK due to the relaxed, uh, relaxed nature of the insurance laws. Tris is a, an ex-champion in his own right in various other classes, and it's an ideal opportunity to launch Derby better into the UK and to ho hopefully find a, you know, a, a worthy world champion of the future in uh, somebody like Tris. So we're putting a bit of something into the sport to try and get youngsters involved in motorcycle racing. Excellent, and there's absolutely no doubt about it, it's a needy thing. I mean, the, the younger we start, we could kick the Italians and, uh, and do a few other European people in it. So just tell us a bit of the background about your riding career then, Trish. Well, I started when I was six doing motocross and had a couple of good seasons. Then I got a bad shoulder injury and finished me in motocross. And I went to road racing last year and had a good season won the championship. Are you looking forward to this on the old derby? You must be. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, anyone would be, wouldn't you, really? Is it going to be a series specifically for just this one machine? No, it's not. Uh, there's other makes of uh, bike as well. Uh, Aprilia, um, Yamaha, other makes of bikes that are all going to be fairly competitive. Top speeds of these bikes are range to about 65 miles an hour, so they're not slow for a 50. So the world knows, so the European public know, and so the British public know. Do we pronounce this Derby or do we pronounce it Derby? It's Derby. Derby it is then. You know, I've had lots of complaints. People are moaning at me saying, why won't I let Wayne on a bike? Just look at the state of this. There was just some of the things that you've missed if you've not attended this year's NEC bike show. That was just a little taster. More delights from the NEC next week. So scoot off, put the kettle on, and we'll be back after the break. Welcome to Two Wheels Better on a red hot day and I've got a red hot bike, the Motor Gutsy Daytona RS. This is even hotter than the normal one. This is the Three Cross Raceco Daytona RS. Extra bits and pieces, forged pistons, Corello rods, light and flywheel, all the bits and pieces. It's got the white power suspension front and rear that normal Gutsy has got, but it's the engine that's been worked on. Up the front here, white power upside down front forks, Brembo calipers, Brembo discs with alloy carriers, fully floating discs, Marchesini three-spoke wheels. Quite a nifty front end, but that is the front end. Weber Morelli fuel injection system and the ignition system, both complementing one another. The exhaust system here, different to the normal Guzzy one, where you've got a big stainless steel collector box there as standard. This one's different. The uh, engine pipes come down and welded together to the actual tail exhaust pipes underneath there. Very free-flowing system, 
nicely linked up to these rather tasty carbon fibre cans which I'm pleased to say are not too noisy. In fact, it's a glorious sound, but not offensive. Honestly, Your Honour. This beautiful red swoopy bodywork not only keeps the blast off you, but it also exposes this beautiful engine. And I'm sure that's the Italian's reason for just having a half fairing. It's overhead camshaft, four valves per cylinder. Here's a neat little touch here. These little aluminium plates bolted onto the cylinder head protects the engine should the bike topple over. And another little touch, should you be out on nasty days in the cold weather, but I can't see why you'd be out in a gauzy in ice and snow, but if you wear, the cylinder heads keep your knees nice and warm. Topping the whole thing off, or perhaps tailing it off, is shaft drive. I mean, this is an out and out sports bike, and it's most unusual for a sports bike to have shaft drive, but Guzzy has got it. Guzzy have always had shaft drive, and it works very, very well. It's got a new cush drive assembly in there, softening the transmission, but it works well. It's got a similar system to BMW to stop the rear suspension jacking up, and it's spot on, and uh, far better than those horrible, messy chains. I might have used the phrase proper motorbike before, but I can't help using it again for this. The Motor Guzzi, or Motor Guzzi as the Italians say, big and gutsy Daytona RS 1100 3 Cross Race Go Limited Edition of that well known V Twin. A massive 1064cc 8 valve overhead cam 90 degree V Twin set across the frame drives this beauty of a beast along through the civilised luxury of a shaft drive. But civilised or not, there's no escaping the fact that the bucket sized pistons pummeling away near your kneecaps are doing a job of work. It's not nerve tingling vibration, this is metallic muscle delivering torque like only the Italians can talk. Lots of it and very, very loud. Having said that, reach 7000 revs and the Weber Morelli electronic ignition and fuel injection system delivers a massive surge that sends you sliding back on the thankfully very comfortable seat. The 5 speed gearbox feels equally man sized, requiring a firm foot to lay down all that poke. And 110 brake horsepower at the back wheel is a lot of poke, believe me. Chassis wise, the Guzzi handles its 223 kilo surprisingly well. Blipping the throttle makes the bike sway a little, but on the move it feels nimble, rock solid and dependable. You know what it's going to do with no nasty surprises, and white power suspension, upside down as at the front, and a monoshock at the rear, keep everything firmly under control. Just like BMW, the shaft drive has an anti-torque linkage to control suspension wind up, and that works well too. Riding position is in the semi-racer mode. Nothing too radical, but it fitted me a treat, while braking is spot on. Massive 320mm front discs, gripped by twin Brembo 4 pots and a single disc at the rear, keep the whole plot under control. The half fairing is surprisingly effective at keeping the blast off, but beautifully effective at showing off that gorgeous, hewn from the solid V-twin lump. You can't help thinking that this is a bike built round an engine, because it won't let you forget it. The exhaust note sees to that. Music to the rider, frightening to the passerby it may be, but very, very involving. You even change gear for the sound of it. When I tested the Firestorm, I said this was going to be the year of the V-Twin. Well, here's another one to stir your passions. At a pound under 13,000 pounds on the road, it's not cheap, but it is exclusive, and anyway, what price sold? Now you might not have seen too many of these on the road. This is Yamaha's SZR 660. A kind of Italian-Japanese crossbreed really. Doesn't look too bad does it? Nice half fairing with a pair of trendy looking twin lamps up front. And lots of Italian styling touches throughout the bike to go with the Italian components. Speaking of which, at the front end, upside down Pioli forks. We've also got Brembo calipers and wheels and a nice big fat Lamp Franconi stainless steel exhaust system. But the most important part of any bike is its heart, its motor. And underneath the half fairing, there's a five valve, single cylinder, liquid cooled engine. 
Now, Yamaha would be the first to admit that all this doesn't sound particularly exciting. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that riding an SNR 660 isn't going to be something that you want to write home about. Let me just tell you something that I discovered when I first got on the bike. Sports bikes aren't known for having a particularly good lock on them. They did take a little bit of turning round, but watch what happens when you give this one full lock. You go like that, and then you bang your thumb and your knuckles on the fairing because it comes right up. Uh, that's a bit of a pain, but you'll only do that two or three times because once you discover how much it hurts, you'll not do it again. Now, I'm a firm believer that there's no such thing as an unexciting bike. They're just different bikes. They all do things in different ways. So now for the most important bit. No, no, not, forget that, not that, not that. Riding the bike. I said there was no such thing as an unexciting bike. Well, I don't quite take it all back. The SZR is exciting in its own way. It's good on the twisty lanes with its small size and lightweight, allowing you to flick it quite aggressively around the bends. The riding position is a little cramped for me personally. It would suit the rider who maybe has shortish legs. That's probably the nicest way to put it. With so many 600cc size of bikes now available, it's difficult to see who would actually buy one of these. For less money, you can have a Suzuki 600 Bandit, the soon to be released Yamaha 600 Phaser, or the new Honda 600 Hornet. I know which one I'd rather be on. What the SZR 660 does do, is it provides an entry into the sports bike scene for those people who might feel a little intimidated at the thought of large amounts of power and race track handling. It's fair to say that the SZR won't frighten you in the power department, but for those people who like the look of a sports bike but don't want the performance, well, maybe it's about right. And in next week's Two Wheels Better, we've an extended report from this year's NEC Bike Show.